Just know your name. Uh, my name is Vadim. Vadim, yes. Uh, so at first I'd like to follow up a little bit on that um, Advaita things. Mm. Um, I mean, I do understand. It's not basically about understanding. It's uh, about like accepting of this conception. As far as I understand, most of the conceptions, they start from uh, separating the one who is acting from, like, let's say, an observer. Like, when I used to like go deeper, I started from Eckhart Tolle, for example, and I think it's like beautiful explanations of like that you and your mind is something completely different. Then when you go deeper, you start to like ask some questions, who is the one, like the observer itself? And you start asking questions like, if the observer really exists, and isn't it another like mind trap and sort of another ego conception? Then you start to think like, hmm, most likely it is not. So it's it's all about like sort of a track. Uh, another mind uh, mind is playing with me. Um, then you start to think like, finally coming back to advise the things like you you start to think like, I'm not this, I'm rather that. And you do understand that the conception of separating um, the one who is acting from the observer doesn't work because the observer doesn't exist. I'm not really sure that it's possible to just to understand it via mental tools. Uh, and like the question in the question is, do you think is it possible to explain the idea to us in particular? Just with the by words, by words, or is it just vital and necessary to live through some kind of a, like let's say, transcendental experience, just to feel it, not just to understand? Let's say some LSD experience when people see something that is like cannot be explained by by words. So is it possible just to explain it via words, or a person should live through some certain experience to, like? To like, totally accept the idea of like um, that, like I am an Atman. And the second question is um, very simple, but at the same time it's extremely difficult because like I feel this is the edge where I'm stuck. I feel I understand this like the observer doesn't exist, uh, but basically the question is how to move further, how to how basically to live. So the question yeah. is basically very simple. Yeah, it is actually a simple question and also has a simple answer. So just to start with your, with your first question, is it possible to have an experience, let, let's say with LSD or with any other method, to have a transcendental experience which will then give you the experience of what Advaita Vedanta, for example, talks about, or the Neo-Advaitins talk about, or of source, of presence, of whatever it is. So what I have to say in this context, especially because you mentioned that you have already gone through these processes of looking for the observer, realizing that there cannot be an observer, doing away with the concept of the observer, disidentifying with actually everything, which are all the steps that people who are on the Advaita Vedanta, Neo-Advaitins I speak about, go through. And then the question is, can the mind at all grasp any of this? And do we need a transcendental experience of some sort to be able to put order into this and not only to see it all conceptually, but to actually experience it in different ways? So, one very important thing is that this teaching over here goes beyond, it is the step after what the Neo-Advaitins teach. What they say, in a nutshell, is when you detach from the thought and enter into a presence, a state of presence, when you identify with self, then that self is simply the observer. And that is considered to be the non-dual state. 
put in very, very simple terms. What is said over here is, no, that's not the non-dual state. It is a state of Sakshi Bhava, witness consciousness. You are there witnessing what is going on. So it is not a non-dual state, it, because if there is the witness, there is that which is witnessed, so it is duality. Essentially, what is said here is that any action that takes place in the thinking in order to put, to detach from the experience of pain and suffering is actually an action of the ego because it does not transform anything. It is simply based on a mental or a, a thinking process that detaches from the suffering without changing the cause of the suffering which is caused by the actions of the ego. So, the step that comes after that is that it is our actions that are causing the pain that we have to endure. So, why is it necessary to have a transcendental experience? Transcendental would mean transcending the contours of the body. If you look at Timothy Leary and all the SLN people who, you know, worked with LSD and, and experienced the transcendental, it means that they were able to transcend the limitations actually of the physicality of this body. They went into cosmic states of experience with LSD, which in the first line results in you losing contour. People who have taken LSD will know that when, when, that at certain stages in certain experiences, because they're never the same, they cease to feel the contours of their bodies. When there is only an identity in existence. At the beginning of that experience, the, the, the body starts to kind of fluid itself out. And, and at one point, there is, there is no body. There's just something which is experiencing something which is not even the body anymore. There comes a point when not even those mild contours exist and it's just pure awareness which is happening. That is what we call the Savikalpa Samadhi states, without attribute. And then comes a point when one only knows one was there because one is back in another state. These are all varying states of dissolution of contour of the body. It is not a loss of identity. It is only the dissolution of the contour because there is always that one point of awareness except when it is a nirvikalpa samadhi state where there is even that is not there. But you can't even know it because you only know it afterwards that time has passed. Now, a transcendental experience cannot bring you to realization of self because it is an experience that is taking you into a cosmic state and not bringing you into a corporeal terrestrial state. You are, because you are, see, if you, if you move into transcendental experience, then your experience is similar to that of the soul actually. It is not a material, physical experience. So, it is like wanting to, wanting to be a spirit when actually you are supposed to be this body. Now, what does a, what does a person do if they are following a, a, a path which is telling them, separate from the thoughts, detach from the thoughts and establish in self? and then you are without pain. They can do that, but they haven't changed the circumstances which cause the pain. As a human being, you have to deal with this body. However transcendental your experiences are and however enlightened you are and however cosmic your states are, at one point you have to come down into this body and deal with the people around you and deal with the reality of this body. So, in answer to your second question as to why 
or how to live then. This is why we invent an identity, we actually decide on an identity. Because if we decide on an identity, then we can take responsibility for the action that is emerging from this body. Because finally the body is moving and doing things, right? If you don't have an identity, if you're not this, 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 you're not this then finally this body is starting to do things where the ego is in charge fully. Because what else is in charge? What else is making it happen? The idea that establishing in presence by observing thoughts is an idea of the ego. It is as you said, or as you were asking me about it, all being conceptual. This is why this, is why this neo advaitin premise is limited and will never result in Self-Realization because it is a conceptual exercise and Self-Realization is not a conceptual exercise. There is Self-Realization in the entire being. When, when the non-dual is experienced, it is not experienced simply by residing in presence because residing in presence is a conceptual exercise. It is experienced when the entire system and every part of the system, the emotional, the conceptual, the physical, that they are all in complete attunement with each other. Because there is that one word which he brought up, which was surrender. And that surrender is to what? What are you surrendering to? If you are detaching from the thoughts and residing in presence and identifying with the soul, then where is the surrender? The surrender is not needed. So, the, so if there is no surrender, how will there be transformation? The transformation can only come through the processes of surrender. And the surrender happens to that soul. That is why that soul is a separate thing. The moment you say, I'm one with that, yes, you'll be fine for a while, but your actions that come from the body are not actions which are determined by a discernment. You know that man, I don't know if... Were, yes, I think you were here, no? When that man was speaking about... Tillman was his name. When, when I asked him, I said, okay, so if you, if you're acting, uh, if you're, if you're, if your presence and you're settled in presence, then who is determining what this body does? Is it presence determining it? And then he said, then he wasn't sure because if presence is determining it, then that's not non-dual. That means there is something which is taking action against or for something with something. Then he said, no, but the Shakti does all of that. So suddenly one new thing entered into the picture called Shakti that is doing all of that. Which sounds beautiful in a book. But when you're living this real life, you need to know what is this body doing. Shakti is doing it. And what is this Shakti, may I ask? It's energy. All right. So who is or what is determining the flow of that energy? You know, in the process of detaching from the thoughts and establishing in presence. It's a very wonderful thing. These gurus have lots of disciples because it's a great feeling of strength and power that suddenly I'm, I'm in presence. And all the pain that is happening, it's just an illusion, it's maya. It's not maya. Because maya is, an, is a concept itself also. Like you said, it's all happening in the thinking. But when the body is acting, it's not happening in the thinking. It's actually taking a step. This is not happening in the thinking. So the concept of Maya is a philosophical concept in order to have a larger understanding of the movements of life and to detach from conceptual pain of existence. Even Maya is a concept. What we are talking about here is something different. It's about what is this body doing in this moment? Is it causing itself pain or not? You asked how to live. How to live is to discern in every moment, is your action going to cause you pain or is it going to cause you joy? 
And you can discern that by finding out where the impulse for that action is coming from. Is it coming from the, from the supreme truth, which is your soul, which is that thing connected to you, that every human being feels somewhere that there is something more than this connected with them? Is that impulse coming from there or is it coming from the ego body of desires and yearnings that society has created? You discern between the two. When it comes from the truth, you take that action. Now, how to do that is the third question. I don't think nobody has their hand up, so you can go into the next one. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, just to make sure I, I got it right. So, like, sort of the, the answer is just to feel uh, what is the source of the action, either uh, truth or ego, right? Yeah, that's the leela. You know the word leela? It's like a, sort of a game. game. It's, a, it's not a game, it's a dance. You are dancing with your soul from moment to moment. And sometimes somebody else comes and tries to put their foot in the middle. That's the ego. And then you kick the foot aside and you keep on dancing with your soul. That's the dance that's going on or should go on. It is actually to avoid complete madness. When a person reaches the stage, like say yourself, you are, you are really a seeker, you're looking for, you're trying to find out what this existence is about. Clearly you are. You've spent your, your time thinking about these things, yes or no? You have. So one would call you a classical seeker. If you want the experience to be holistic and not simply a conceptual exercise, turning around in your head, you have to go into the consciousness of the body itself. The body, this is, I am this. I'm not that, I'm this. And when I'm clear about the fact that I'm this, then I can choose to be that or not if I choose to. I can also be that. So what I'm saying here is diametrically opposite to what the Neo-Advaitins teach. Because it is only one step. There is no place for surrender and surrender is the crucial thing. If you don't experience surrender in the system and you spoke about experience, what is the experience? The experience is surrender, sweet surrender. It's that ultimate sweetness that this body can experience when it is in surrender. Sorry to interrupt, this is just important for me. Surrendering, surrendering to, to what exactly? The surrender, see, actually what happens is that surrender is something which is a natural state of the system. It is, it is in a flow with everything, that is surrender, just being in the flow. What happens is that as the ego grows, the more complex the society is in which you grow up, the bigger the ego you have. So it stops you from feeling that dance with the soul, the soul, the antaratman. Now, the surrender that we speak about is the surrender to that impulse coming from the soul. The soul is sending an impulse in every moment. It's a binary cosmic impulse. And just because we don't feel it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It is only because we have lost touch with it. And so we have created this idea that we can identify with soul and become one with it. And that's a mental, that's a conceptual exercise of the Neo-Advaitins who feel that they have identified with soul and are now observing everything in a blissful state. But what is causing the pain is not addressed because there's no surrender. The body, the body makes the pain happen or not. So the body has to do the right thing in a given moment. If somebody, if a person is, is hurting themselves with the actions of the body and then stepping into a neo-advaitin posture of detaching from the thoughts that cause that pain, where is the incentive to change the actions of the body that actually causes that pain? 
That is why you have to invent this identity because if you invent an identity and you hold on to it dogmatically, it then allows you at the beginning of this sadhana, of course, later on, there is not much need for identity because the experience of surrender is so powerful. The, the body is in a, in a non-dual state because it is in surrender to the soul. And its actions are coming from that, so there's no observer anymore. There's nothing to observe because it's just action after action after action after action. It's about tuning in to that soul and going with the impulse with courage, in surrender. So the way to live is, take up an identity, adhere to it, and decide in every moment what action this identity is going to take. Your mind decides on an identity. And that identity, Vadim, son of your mother's name from wherever you are, actually you can tell me your mother's name. It's Ludmila. Ludmila. From? From Russia. Russia. Okay, so Vadim, son of Ludmila, from Russia, is your identity from this moment on. And all the rest is mental gymnastics. You, you can go mad like that. You can go to the edges of madness if you keep on and on and on going into those states without the surrender. Ramana's disciples were in, they were in Guru Vada. He was their guru, they were in Guru Shishya Parampara. That's why they didn't go mad. You know how many of these people I see that are going, actually going bonkers, because at one point they just don't know anymore, who am I, what am I, am I this, am I that, are you this, am I you, are you me? And their lives are determined by that, they can't live normally anymore. So that, at that point we are talking about the mind having gone beyond a certain, to the peripheries, because there is no surrender, neither to the outer guru nor to the inner guru. And mainly with Westerners who are, who are not culturally trained to respond to Guru Vada, they have to start responding to their inner guru. So surrender has to be part of it. And it will never be popular with people because surrender is very challenging. It's like the word. Sweet surrender, sweet surrender, sweet surrender. Surrender, 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 surrender. Just once again surrendering to the idea that the, at the very beginning I accept my uh, like basic identity, like I am the son of... Mm -hmm, uh, Not of... Mm -hmm, uh, of Ludmila. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the son of Ludmila from Russia. Uh, I take this as an identity and no more, not more. No, no, not more, because then, and then, and then. you're moving into ego then. Okay, okay. So keep it simple, keep it really simple, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm just, honestly, I didn't get surrendering to what? Surrendering. To the soul. The soul which is your master, which is your... Imagine, you, you, okay, let's go into imagination. Mm -hmm. If till the experience is material, let's go into imagination. Imagine you have a nice little soul dancing next to you all the time. Like this little atom is there and it's your master and it's telling you always what is the right thing to do this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment. You're surrendering to it by obeying what it's telling you to do. How do you know? You ask it. In the beginning of this sadhana, the first years of practice, it is always about asking, is this action coming from the truth or coming from ego? And then you ask this question and then you can feel where it's coming from. But it's again, it's a tricky thing. How Very to tricky. How identify it's like uh, ego, soul, again, even thinking like in that sort of like splitting ego and, and soul, it's again in a conception anyway. I'll tell you why it's not. The impulse of the soul is a material impulse. You feel it materially. You act, that's the, that, that's, it's not a concept. It's a material impulse. So, soul is material. I got it yes. Right. And it's sending an impulse. If I say that the soul is material and it sends a material impulse, people look at me like, 
what is she talking about? Soul is pure consciousness. How can it be material? But it is material, the impulse, the impulse of that living presence is material in nature and it can be felt by the body and if the body has to feel it, an identity has to be created in the thinking because otherwise the thinking does not surrender. Now I start to understand the idea. Yeah, and it's, ma it's, it's fascinating, it's, it's just the biggest thing that has happened in the spiritual trajectory in the history of spirituality for the moment, this is the big thing. And just because there's someone sitting here who's an Indian woman who nobody knows about doesn't mean that what I'm saying is not something massive. It is. Because it is a total... It's, a, it's like a turnaround in what has been attempted over the last couple of millennia. You know, where the experience was actually to seek the transcendental, to go into samadhi states, and then to experience pure consciousness in the samadhi state, and then to re-enter into the body and connect with the body again. And uh, very specific question, but even in the samadhi state or under LSD experience, anyway, who is the one who is observing it? Who? Isn't it an ego anyway? Even when you're under LSD, for example, who is observing everything? Actually, anything that this body experiences is an experience that is interpreted by the thinking. Except when the consciousness expands to the extent where the actual materiality of this body has experiences which are not interpreted by the thinking. And you can only know that if you actually have the experience. So who is the thing that is experiencing? It is the, it is the materiality that is experiencing itself. There's no thinking that can be attached to it. Even describing it is, is not what is actually going on. Your question is, 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 is exactly what the whole problem is, that even that experience, what they call the pure consciousness, which is experiencing it, is interpreted by the thinking. So it, it is a form of ego, finally. But because it is a valid experience in itself, it is taken into account. It's taken into account, but there is nothing experiencing anything. So I, I can tell you that I'm sitting over here now. And actually, if you ask me, is there anything which is experiencing anything? Is there the experience of presence? Or I don't have anything like that. If at all I could describe the experience in any sense, it would be a complete and total instrument of an external force, which is, or an external entity, which is the soul, which we give a name of a soul. And the rest of it is just action happening. Because beyond that, we again fall into thinking. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I didn't get about external. It's external in the sense that you can't identify with it. You know, because then it's ego, it's like... So the only way to live through this life in some... In case everything is external, right? more or less. No, no, not really, because there is the experience of the contour of the body. That's why you create an I. When you create this I, this Vadim, son of Ludmila from Moscow, uh, from Russia... Right, right, from Moscow. From Moscow. Then you've created that, and now that thing is basically sort of a, sort of also, it's also ego, but it is required in order to, in order to, for this body to actually act in a way that doesn't cause it pain. And if, if this is not the way to live, then what other way is there to live? Take the case of the Neo-Advaitins who are in a state where they, where they detach from the thoughts that cause pain. 
and they are residing in supreme presence. What they assume is the non-dual, which of course is not the non-dual because there is something that is observing everything. So it cannot be the non-dual. So they are there and then today passes and tomorrow passes and every time any thought of pain or suffering arises, there is detachment from that and the, the ego convincing themselves that they are in supreme presence, identified with supreme presence. But the moment you identify with something and the moment you're observing something, you are not that. It is ego observing. Uh, can we just work it through an example? If like, yes. th these guys uh, try to separate them th th themselves from any emotion, doesn't matter, good or bad, whatever. They think like, I, I, I'm not that. Um, that is basically, obviously, a conception anyway. But how practically to go deeper and to walk through the experience of surrendering to this to the connection of soul and body and acting like of the signals from the soul to the body. So as an example, disturbing th th thoughts, for example, if I'm annoyed and disturbed by like... Yes. So let's take Vadim. Vadim is being disturbed by... What, what would, would be a thought that would disturb you? Name a thought. Or describe it a little bit. So I let's, understand. Let's say it's some paranoid fear, for example, of something is going to happen. Okay. So how would we walk through this? So Vadim is sitting there in, in Moscow in his apartment and he opens the window and he looks down and he sees something and he's suddenly afraid. He just feels fear. So what would he do? He would say, I'm Vadim, I'm son of Ludmila from Moscow and this is fear that is happening to me. So, I know that it is ego. Let me tune in to the truth. And then he, he turns, the identity he has created in his own thinking, turns away from the fear towards an entity that he knows, which he has also created in his head finally, represents love, the opposite of fear. So when he's tuned into that, he settles into a non-fear state. That is how he would live that moment out. Take another example. I'll walk you through that as well. But even if to come back to that, <coughs> to that yes. example, uh, coming back to, like you said, um, since self is material, Yes. Uh, in that case, like I should kind of uh, like feel something, like the opposite to fear in that particular example. You will feel something. But I sh should feel like, like let's say, love as it's all, right? Yes. Should it be like, sorry for this pretty much rational... No, we have, look, it has to work in the rational, otherwise it doesn't work. Because the human being is a thinking and self-reflecting creature. So for... First, you have to understand it rationally, and then you practice it and experience it. So, your questions are very valid in this context, however rational they are. In fact, I welcome a rational question, yes. So it's, it's much more difficult with the irrational one. <laughs> so, if, if I feel like, like falling afraid from falling from the window or something, some sort of fear that it's basically not really trusting to the unfolding experience, um, I should like rather switch from that fear to kind of an inner something more... I didn't get it, honestly. You have to tell yourself dogma... It's, it's becoming dogmatic. You have to be dogmatic to live sane, is what I'm saying. Spirituality is about living this life in a sane way. What? Sane. Uh, opposite of mad, sanity, to live in sanity. So you're, you have created an identity, and that identity has turned away from the fear towards the truth, which creates the experience of love. How does that truth happen? It is a matter of practice, of course. We are here, for example, on a month-long yatra, a travel. What are we doing, actually, on this yatra? It is a 
daily process of learning these ways and means by which to tune into that to that truth beyond the the demand of the ego so that tuning into the truth process is what you learn as part of your sadhana or spiritual practice so there's like an, an instrument a tool a practice of see the ego has taken so long to build up we need the weapons that we need to deal with that ego the tools the practices the weapons that make it possible for a human being to live a life which is emerging from the truth and therefore less painful than when the actions are emerging from the ego the practices to tune into that truth are the practices that are that are taught here to even open up to the possibility that you can live in a conscious decision in every moment making a choice in every moment between the ego and the truth even this idea is what is brought up brought up over here so some people start the practices already as we are speaking you know they try to tune in they try to discern some of them deepen the practices it is a choice how much each one wants to deepen into that practice at least don't go into the practice where you're observing the thoughts identifying with presence feeling that presence but not transforming what is causing the the suffering when i feel like fear for example some nervous uh, feeling nervous there is a um, uh, a method a practice uh, that you obviously teach that helps me uh, that could help me to easily uh, switch from this to to some inner instantly not easily instantly because you don't have time if you're at the window and you're that scared you don't have time to spend it's a it's a tu- you can do it right now i mean if you make a decision that you have a soul even if you don't feel it if you, you can also mm-hmm. since you're deciding so many other things you might as well decide that you have a soul okay. these are all beliefs that we have in our head if anyway everything is a belief then why not believe that you have a soul you might as well take that create it in your head i'm i'm okay to to, to believe right you have a soul so if you experience fear no no that that is the ego so it's anyway not the thing to even look at so you instantly turn away and tune into your soul it's like you know it's like you have a uh, your master your spiritual master sitting next to you and the moment you feel fear you go and hug the master that's what you're doing that's the kriya that's the practice because there are a lot of people who's minds have been overactive for that long that they cannot distinguish any more between i'll just give you an example somebody was here yesterday and one of my students was asked i heard somebody calling her maya so is she an illusion or is she real and then i have to say this is strange stuff is she an illu- the person is sitting in front of me i'm sitting here so because my name is my name is not maya they call me maya and the person heard that someone called me maya and then was asking themselves is she actually real or is she an illusion now that for me is over the border a neo advaitin because at one point this identification with the presence is such a huge illusion that the ego has created that it actually starts to believe that it is the divine presence and so is no more able to to make sense of the material world you know what i'm trying to say and then and then suddenly it's not sure anymore is this an illusion or is this a reality and then we are talking about a messed up mind spirituality is about being present being tuned into the source being a source of compassion 
in this very, very, very pain-ridden world of suffering. It's not an, an act of increasingly feeding the, the, the conceptual ego. That is why we have to invent an I, because otherwise we go mad. So, who am I? I don't need to know who I am. I need to create an identity that does with this body what has to be done till the day I die and embraces the joys of this world. It's, it has to be simple like this. Otherwise, the human being that continues to go on that conceptual trip will go into madness. Fear, basically, what happens is that they go into fear, which is the ego's answer to love. Thank you for that explanation. I was basically... Um, I was thinking something something more or less the same. Uh, that is like sort of like necessary to not to like, to become crazy to to invent a like a small small. Yeah, and you Russians are anyway massive thinkers. You all are in danger of going mad, you Russians, if you are following too much of this neo Advaitin stuff, because that thinking the Russians they are they are they are, they are actually existentially interested in about their own existence and the, 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 I think it's, what is the drink you drink there? Slivovitz? No, not Slivovitz. Drink? Vodka. vodka. The vodka helps in the process, of course, of this going back. <laughs> so, it's like one has to bring back the spiritual experience into sanity and the, that trip of detachment will take you away from sanity, away. When you are solidly in this thing, when you're here and now, and you have a little bit of identity so that you don't go mad, then you can tune into your soul, hold on to it, to your master, and surrender to it. And then suddenly this compassion starts to flow, and at one point, there is no soul, there is no master, there is no you, there is no this, there is no that, but you're sane. You know? You're just sane. You're not in that insane idea of identification with soul. It's still that, but it's this. In the later stages of this sadhana. Um, if you allow one more thing, just more, more clarifications yeah. for me. Um, <laughs> Your mind you, is going. Uh, I mean, I really like it because I do appreciate uh, like the rational approach to things, where a person uh, is able to explain it simply and rationally, and all that like sort of a stupid or whatever questions. Uh, so another one is like. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I, I, I do. I do really appreciate. It. Um, so um, just probably I'm pushing too much and I, no no I, you you can you you can push because if we don't push we don't reach the see your 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 mind your thinking you know it will not be satiated it'll never be but it'll always try to step beyond this because the point the block point is the surrender issue that's the that's the main problem, the surrender. So let's you can push as long as of course the time is and, and maybe you do have an experience if you practice. You know what I mean? Because not everything will be realized in the thinking, it's also the actual practice. Yeah, I know I'm just uh, I do really understand that most of the things they like only 10% or something comes only through your mind, but all the rest is just you sort of feel it. One sixth comes through the thinking. Uh, but still sometimes it's just, at least for me personally, it's, it's vital to... Uh, so just coming back to the key thing of your teaching that is surrendering, surrendering to, to, to your soul, the signals from the soul. But um, I'm really okay if you say that it's, it's impossible to explain without the practice. I'm, I, I will really accept that, uh, accept that this is fine. But uh, still... Um, no, uh, I have to interrupt you here. I never said that it's impossible to explain without a practice. I'm explaining it. I'm saying 
there is a soul, it is material in nature and it sends an impulse. Now, if you have to experience that impulse, then you have to take a practice. But conceptually, logically, it's a statement. There is something which sends an impulse. Okay. And there is an identity which you create, which responds to that impulse. So conceptually, my presentation is valid. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want the experience of my, of my presentation, then you have to, it's like you have to take up the practice. Mm -hmm. You can also take up the practice on your own, is what I said, at least to try it. Okay, so I know the question like, what should a person, like me in particular, yes. if I don't have a um, that permanently clear vision of the signals, and in any case of that falling from the window or whatever, anyway, I come to that chit of written road, like that monkey is in my head, like I'm in a rush to, to that trying to, to find a signal from the soul, and I do not feel it, and, and, and in that case, again, I fall into conceptual. If you are a conceptual being who is not able to actually move into a transformative state to feel that, that impulse, then you create in your thinking, you create a soul in your thinking, which is not, of course, material in nature because you don't have the experience, but it's in your thinking and you hold on to that in your thinking. So I, so I shouldn't, I should give up this idea? No, I'm saying that's a, that's a step, it's a start. So you are there at the window, you're afraid you're going to fall. You say, this is the ego because it's fear. Okay, I have to turn away from this fear. Oh, let me turn to that other thing I created, which is the soul, which is my, my guru, my master, my source of truth. Let me hold on to it. And you hold on to it conceptually because the fear is in the conceptual for you in that moment. And you have not had the experience materially and physically of that soul, so you have to... Sorry, to interrupt, how to practically hold on? Is it sort of a... You look at it. You turn away from the fear and you look at it, the truth as a concept. As a concept. To start with, so because for me what you imagine soul, something, truth, yes. And I just try to switch. From you switch. From fear to this, but if I'm not able to... First, first let... <laughs> First, I'm saying that because you are not able to tune into the source because you haven't learned that practice, you start to imagine that it is there in the thinking because unless you do the practice, you can't feel it. And the practice means always asking yourself in every moment, where is this action or this will to action arising from? So let's say you want to eat something before you put it in your mouth or before you pick it up, you say, is this something coming from the ego or is it that other thing that she was talking about in, when I was in India? <laughs> then you're like, mm, I don't know, I don't feel anything. Then you're in another situation and you feel fear. Then you say, okay, I, this is ego. Uh, let me, let me see, okay. Let me just create some truth for the moment and let me just hold on to it. In the thinking, because unless you learn to discern, you cannot make that step to actually feeling the soul. And unless you feel the soul, you cannot make the step to the experience of non-dual. Now, how do you do that? You are quite smart conceptually to be able to do that. It's a choice because you're able to conceive of such complex thoughts. Why can't you conceive of a little light of truth somewhere in your head? You have no other choice. That's the only way. You're able to conceive such complex thoughts. Right. Who is able to conceive those thoughts? Vadim, son of Ludmila from Moscow, is able to conceive those thoughts. Who is Vadim, son of Ludmila? We don't have to ask who is Ludmila because that would take it to another level. <laughs> we don't know anything else about who this Vadim is, he's just son of Ludmila. He himself doesn't know who he is because he isn't. We are nothing actually, it's just a body in action. 
It's this mind that is convincing itself that there's something going on. So that mind has to feed itself. So it feeds itself a truth. It feeds itself an ego. It feeds itself. It tries to put meaning into an existence which does not require meaning because the questions fall away when the consciousness expands. You won't have these questions once you start to bend. Because the mind is taken charge of you, you know. So that's why I say create these things in your mind and start playing with it in your mind and slowly it sickles down into the rest of the being. Now I'm just very stupid and funny question, but still like, looks like we invent and uh, create uh, a formal uh, identity like Vadim, son of, of Ludmila in the beginning, conception one. Conception two, uh, we uh, we invent a uh, conception that uh, I should switch from ego to to soul, and we invent like kind of a soul conception, and like the conception yes. of the truth is, is here. So like, looks like conception after conception. Exactly. Anyway. And doesn't it look it's like a, a good proper candies for the mind? So it's like we are sort of a tricking mm -hmm. the mind anyway. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's exactly what we're doing. We're tricking the mind to the point where the experience becomes physical. When you actually experience that impulse materially, then you'll know, because it's a, it's a material experience in the body, then you'll know that it is not simply in the concept. It's not simply a concept. It could still be an invention of the conceptual, but it's not a concept. It is a material experience. And We have a choice because we are using the thinking, right? So all these things are happening in the thinking. We also have a choice to just not think so much and just be, you know? But when we are, where is the being of this body receiving its impulse to action from. Let's assume we don't think anything. Let's assume the body is just doing, 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 doing. From somewhere it's receiving the impulse. Then they say it's Shakti is making it happen. Why is Shakti telling you to eat things which cause you harm to the body? which cause you pain and suffering. Let's leave the thinking out. It's Shakti at play, right? Okay, so why is, the, what, why is this Shakti causing you suffering? Then you can say, that's because I'm supposed to suffer. So it'll go on ad nauseum, which is why we invent an identity and teach that identity to discern between the ego as the source of action or the soul as the source of action. At least, it is allowing you to discern between ego and truth. And it is suggesting that surrender is that which will keep you actually within the, the peripheries of sanity and not let you jump out. Because without surrender... Uh, so this is sort of like, uh, at some points, we're going to use these conceptions and on a later stage, with the practice, we should like feel that like all the conceptions can vanish and you kind of... Pretty uh, much, they do actually vanish. In a sense, you become like an instrument, which is increasingly actually doing actions that bring joy to the system and reduce the suffering of the system. That's what happens after a while. You know, like, just as an example, I'll come to you, Angie. I'll come to both of you. Just as an example, when I come and sit here, I'm, so, I'm just sort of speaking, you know? I'm tuning in to the soul. It's a soul-to-soul -soul thing. It's not, I can barely see, I can barely realize actually, it's just that the soul-to-soul -soul thing and what is to be, what the body has to say, it's saying. It's like an instrument in action. 
but it's not an instrument which is in a bliss state and just smiling at everyone and just floaty and not really capable of writing a check and paying the bills, but just, it's not like that. It's a very present state, very materially aware. And even if you look at me, you'll feel that, no? That there is a, there is a solidity here, but that solidity is something that each person sitting here is intrinsic to their nature. It's just because the ego is an action that that contour and solidity is not yet there. So it's not like this bliss masters and that it's all, I'm in supreme consciousness. No, I'm in, you're very much in a body and this body is very much in, in action and aware of the action. So it's self-realization, it's not enlightenment, which is actually a transcendental experience and which takes you away actually from the materiality of this body. And finally, this body is an action, it's just an action. And the more it is bending, the more it is in surrender, the more the action is causing love, causing joy around, also for this thing, but also for all the other things.